Hello, everybody. Hello? Is that working? Yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our very first Entrepreneurs in Global Health Initiative. Um, it's actually not it's the first, it's actually not the first time we're doing this. We were doing this for many years under the more humble name of Startup Track. This year we have a fancier name and it's the new, basically the new and, new and improved Startup Track where we have, uh, in the past we had 10 people presenting, now we have five uh, very innovative startup ventures presenting. And these have already been selected from the charity BIH Entrepreneurship Summit some months ago. So these have already been basically the winners of another um, startup entrepre medical entrepreneur conference. Um, basically what you're gonna see today is five very innovative startup ventures who are basically the leaders of next generation ideas for next generation medical uh, solutions to medical issues globally. So um, our first one, our first venture, has a very cool name, but they also do something really cool with T-cells. I hope that they're gonna tell us why. I hope, so the, please welcome Jana Hockman from Captain T-cell. Maybe she'll even tell us why they're called Captain T-cell. Thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, my name is Jana Hachmann, and I'm part of Captain T Cell. I hope this works. Does this work? Is it not working? It did work five minutes ago. Ah, yeah. not working. Okay. Perfect. Um, so we're at Captain T Cell. We're a pre seed spin off project at the MDC right here in Berlin. And we're working on next generation T cell receptors for T cell immunotherapy. I can tell you more about the name later, but let me first start by telling you what we do. So I want to start by taking a little detour to the immune system. I'm sure you're all familiar with being sick, having a cold, for example. And these are usually caused or often caused by viral infections. And luckily, most of us have a functioning immune system where we can pretty easily clear these viral infections. And the way that the immune system does this is by using the most potent immune cells, the T cells, to detect and kill virus-infected cells. So the question came up several years ago whether we can use this inherent ability of T cells to not only kill virus-infected cells, but to also kill cancer cells. And the answer came several years ago that that's indeed possible. So here you can see a picture of Emily Whitehead. She was very sick with ALL. That's the most common childhood leukemia. It's usually treatable pretty well, but she was unlucky and she relapsed after treatment. And there were no more treatment options left for her and her parents were really desperate. She was admitted to hospice. And so they decided to enroll her in a clinical trial for T cell therapy. The way that this therapy works is Blood was collected from Emily's body. The T cells were isolated from her blood and they were genetically modified with a cancer specific receptor. In this case, it was a chimeric antigen receptor, a CAR. It's basically like sticking an antibody on top of a T cell. So these modified T cells were then reinfused into her body where they started to roam around, look for cancer cells, and they found the cancer cells and they killed the cancer cells and it saved Emily's life. So this really was as close to a miracle in treating cancer as you can get. So CAR T cell therapy really works amazingly well. The problem is it only works for a subset of cancers, less than 10% of all cancers. Because in order for this therapy to work, CARs need to detect something on the surface of the cancer cell that distinguishes the cancer cell from healthy cells. And unfortunately, most cancer cells look pretty much the same as healthy cells from the outside. So there really remains a high medical need for cell therapies, T cell therapies, for many types of cancers and indications. So what's being done in the next generation of T cell therapy, and that's also what we're working on, is the generation of T cell receptors, TCRs, instead of CARs. And they're different from CAR, TCRs and CARs differ in that TCRs can also detect intracellular proteins, not just extracellular proteins. And a lot of t uh, cancers really look different from the outside. Not, don't look different from the outside, but from the inside, sorry. So this really opens up this therapy to a lot of new indications. And 
what we're working on is TCR, T-cell therapy. So there are a few challenges in this new type of therapy. First, the first challenge is the identification of relevant targets. So in order to understand that, you have to know that the immune system constantly communicates with all the cells in the body to de de determine whether they're healthy or sick. And the way that this happens is the immune system basically cuts up some of the proteins inside each cell and transports parts of those outside to be displayed to the immune system as epitopes. And our competitors, in order to determine which pieces get transported to the outside, are using epitope prediction pro programs. The problem is often these don't work very well, and they only work for a subset of patients with a specific genetic variant. So depending on the patient population that you're looking at, this can be between 18 and 47 percent of all patients. So the rest of these patients, over half of the population, will never benefit from these therapies. So what we're doing is we're trying to develop our therapy for all genetic variants. And in order to tackle both of the challenges, we're using our proprietary TCR isolation platform, and we've already used it to identify 30 novel TCRs, and we've selected our lead candidate that we're now working on in preclinical development, and next year when we found our company, are then continuing on with process development and a clinical trial. So we really believe we can do this, and we've already received quite a few endorsements. In 2016, we won the world's largest business plan comp life science business plan competition, One Start. In 2017, we participated in the BioVaria and won the spin-off panel and partnering award. And last year, we secured a partnership with a big pharmaceutical company. We're working on pr public funding right now. We um, have already received about $4 million in public, uh, public pre-seed funding, and that's funding our research right now through the GoBio program from the, uh, the German Ministry for Re Education and Research. So I want to leave you with this picture of Emily. She's now seven years cancer-free. So this really shows that T-cell therapy has the power to cure cancer, and we want to use our technology to bring this therapy to new indications and patient groups. And in order to do that, we're looking for clinical collaboration partners and, of course, funding. So I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Hello. Oh, yeah. So, Jana, thanks for that. That was tear-jerking, could you could say, with really amazing, um, amazing success with that girl. and. Amazing technology we have here. Do, are we, do we have any questions now? Does anybody want to ask Jana a question from the audience? Okay. Uh, but this is limited only to cancer cells which are in circulation because, you know, solid cancers cannot be reached uh, by T cells because uh, cancer cells in solid uh, cancers uh, produce a lot of matrix proteins to, to protect all these epitopes. So you should uh, say, uh, this is to only to a limited number of cancers which you can use. Well, you're right. Hematological cancers are the easiest to um, address. It's not impossible to address solid tumors, but yes, we are starting with the easy cancers. The first indication that we're looking at is a hematological indication. But there's a lot of development happening right now that is trying to extend this therapy also to solid tumors, and we're also working on that, but it is very challenging. I agree. So you would have to add a collagenase or a heparinase in front of your uh, T-cells. Yeah, there are different options of, of addressing this pro problem, but it is a big problem. I, I agree. Is there another question? Anybody? Yes, a question all the way up there. I think from this side. Maybe you can uh, meet her halfway or something. <laughs> That's actually um, the, the core of our technology. So we have an HLA library where we can um, address the different, different HLA types. So it's not that one therapy will be available for every patient, but we can make the therapy available for every HLA group or every HLA type. Test of 
Okay, do we have time for another one or is that a short one? Anybody have a question? A short question? Okay, I have a question for you then. I won't ask you about your name. <laughs> Yeah, um, like I said, we participated in the um, business plan competition one start in 2016, and we really um, knew that there were a lot of other companies or startup projects participating. And um, so we looked for a name that was going to stand out and be easily remembered. And uh, it worked out of 400, I'm sure it's not the only reason, but out of 400 startup projects, we won. And um, so it was originally meant a little bit as a joke, but now we really like it and we're sticking with it for it's now. It's definitely unique. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jana. So our second startup actually has a pretty straightforward name, but it spells it very unusually so that I was really, I didn't actually know how to say it at first, but um, it's actually just dental x-ray and uh, pretty much says exactly what they do. So please welcome Falk Schwendeke to the stage. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm Falk Schwendeke. I'm a dental professor here at the Charité, and I'm also the chief medical or dental officer of Dental X-Ray. We are a decision support system for dentists and dental diagnostics. And we are mainly focusing on this, on dental X-rays, and most of you will have had such an X-ray in the past. A lot of black and white stuff, teeth, anatomical structures, something doesn't look right on one area there on the upper left. You see anatomic uh, structures like the sinuses, but also decay or periodontal bone loss, gum disease, and things you wouldn't like on yourself. And the problem with these X-rays is as follows. They are widely used in dentistry. They are by far the number one X-rays you see in medicine, dental X-rays. More than 50 million are taken each year in Germany alone. But interpreting them is manual and is subjective. And on top of that, it's also quite labor intensive. And there's lots of evidence showing, for example, that dentists miss up to 50% of findings on X-rays. And on the other hand, they come up with about the same ratio, 50% of stuff which isn't there, so false positive findings, leading to a lot of treatment variants. And for example, for the average dental patient, like that guy, the Germans may know him, it's a famous German actor with excellent teeth. He goes to the dentist very regularly, properly, as most of you do, and has a lot of dental care based on x-rays, spending a lot of money on it. So there's really a big problem with these false positive and false negative diagnoses. And the second problem is, the dentist spends a lot of time on assessing x-rays, especially these more complex ones, and afterwards he needs to write down all this stuff manually using his keyboard. And we checked this in our clinic on a software system. It takes something between 5 to 12 minutes, depending on what kind of x-ray you're having. Dental x-ray is going to change that. Using state-of-the-art AI machine learning technology, we will provide faster, better diagnostics to dentistry. So how do we do this? With only one click, the dentist will upload his image, and I will come to this later, how he does this, into our system, and within five to 10 seconds, all our run models run in parallel to provide him with this. An augmented version of the image showing a lot of restorations, dental work being done in the past, but also pathologies like caries, like inflammations in the bone, maybe even some more serious stuff. And then he can go stepwise through these different findings, confirm them, alter them if needed, and with only one click, generate a report which looks like that, very similar to reports he knows, without even touching his keyboard. We are seeing from uh, our clinical validation studies that the accuracy is increased by up to 40% when using such technology. The speed of the assessment, especially of reporting these findings, is decreased a lot to roughly only four to five minutes instead of 10 minutes, so a 50% lower uh, time requirement for diagnostics and reporting. And what a lot of the dentists who tried our tools uh, said to us is that it also helps to talk to the patient, to increase trust with the patient, because it's essentially like a second independent opinion he provides to his or her patients. The market for such tools is not without competitors. There are a number of them, both in the EU and also in the US. But we have a number of things where we think we are unique. First of all, we have access to Europe's largest university hospital, the Charité here in Berlin, with lots of data, hundreds of thousands of data points, images, but also patient's data, sociodemographic data, clinical data, and in a lot of cases also from different time points, so longitudinal data. 
We have a huge pool of partners, but also dentistry and the Charité, allowing us for high quality expert annotations, which is essentially the magic source of everything. To get better than the average dentist, we need excellent annotations. And we have a team of machine learning and AI experts here at the Charité. The market is huge. I already mentioned the 55 million x-rays in Germany and dentistry. And as you can see in the EU and the US, it's even a multifold of this. So dental x-rays are really, really a big market and a big opportunity to improve patients' care. We are going through two two models for basically distributing our product. It's a B2B uh, product. We are either targeting patient device and patient uh, documentation software manufacturers, as well as radiographic device manufacturers, both providing softwares which dentists have in their practice already, so that we don't market directly to the dentist, but via these partners. And we already have several LOIs and NDA signed, which partners in both fields there. We have a prototype which we are currently better testing. We are going into CE certification process at the end of this year. We will hopefully be on the market in May of 2020, and in 21 we will then expand into the US and other markets. Our long-term vision is to be an integrated platform for data in dentistry. So to improve a more precise, personalized medicine by integrating different data over different time points. And to do this, we have a very diverse team grounded in medicine and dentistry, but also in the business side, as well as in data science and software engineering. So really complementing each other. And we hope that this is interesting for you in the room. And if you want to talk to us, we're here the whole day. And I think that dentistry is something tangible to most of you. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you, Falk. Does uh, anybody have a question for Falk in the audience? Yes, there is a hand right over here. Yeah, my question is about the money. So what's the difference in cost from the traditional x-ray to your uh, new approach per, per x-ray? Well, that, that's hard to tell because, of course, in most systems in high-income countries, the costs for an X-ray are fixed by any kind of insurance body or statutory insurance or something like that. But what you will see is that the time decrease makes a big difference in the real cost this X-ray produces. So, for example, a German dentist hour is worth like 250 euros. So if you say you save 5 to 10 minutes, that's a saving of 12 to 20 euros uh, roughly per X-ray. And that would somehow be translated into whomever benefits from that, if it's the insurance, if it's the dentist, but that's roughly the amount you're talking about. Another question for Falk in the audience? Okay, I'll ask you a question. There, there was a question. Oh, so there's a question. Oh, yeah, right over there. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, what uh, quality do the X-ray images, uh, of obviously digital images, um, have to have? Uh, is it c can it be any, or is it standardized? I guess no. Well, these images they they usually come at least in, in many countries uh, in the EU. They come in a in a standardized format. I think also in the US and DICOM, so it's a yes. standard mm -hmm. medical image format. But that doesn't mean that the quality is necessarily standardized and good. So yeah. you will have very poorly taken x-rays, and of course, if, if the x-ray is not interpretable to a dentist, then our models will not be in, a, easily able to interpret them as well. So there will be like a mechanism saying, well, sorry, this x-ray is either too resolution or it's too blurry or something like that. But it's fairly robust against these things because we feed a realistic set of x-rays from a number of sources into these models, and hence we can deal with a number of x-rays, and it doesn't need to be the perfect x-ray, basically. Because as I was thinking, uh, if there's uh, one time <laughs> in my life, an electronic health record where I, where I can see as a patient uh, my own um, X-ray pictures or images. Maybe I can use this software and to check what my dentist did the last years with my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dentists would love that, I'm sure. No. I'm sure too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that is obviously one option, yes, to, to go down that route as well. But it's not what we're planning at the moment. We have time for one more question. We have a, a hand raised. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Steve. I'm from Norway. Um, I have the, uh, two questions, actually. One, I go to my dentist uh, twice a year and take x-rays on my teeth. And normally, these films used for x-ray are very, very painful. I don't know if it's only my dentist. But I don't know if you looked at the design of that as well. But 
The second question is, how sensitive is your X-ray artificial intelligence to soft tissues? You mentioned bones, but uh, there could be nerve irritations as well, and uh, how sensitive is the, this to diagnosing a uh, soft tissue? Okay. So first of all, we are not working on the X-ray technology itself, so we, we haven't touched the hardware. It's a, it's a software solution for the available image. Uh, so I know that intra or X-rays can be quite uncomfortable in some cases, but that's just bad luck. And hey, it's dentistry. It's always uncomfortable, isn't it, to some degree. Um, but the second question, we are dealing with X-rays here, so we are focusing on hard tissues, on mineralized tissues. So soft tissues, they don't play a big role. We are having bony things and tooth-related things because te teeth are mineralized as well, but you wouldn't see any kind of soft tissue aspects in these X-rays. So you would need different imagery material, which is, of course, something, as I said, we are looking forward into the future because we want to be an integrated platform for dental imagery, but it's not our focus right now. Okay, thanks, Falk. That was great. If people, as uh, Falk mentioned before, but if uh, people have other questions or want to talk to the various ventures today, they'll be here all day, and we have a little booth, like if you were, if you're coming in, it's directly to the right behind the bar. There's a table there where you can meet them. So our, our third venture is already at her place. So what I find especially exciting about our third startup is that is their topic because uh, I've been doing this a bunch of years and there's always there's lots of talks and lots of ventures who address things like the the big diseases like oncology and vascular issues this is the first time we have had a venture focused on muscle wasting and so let's welcome Verena Schuvel and Myopax Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to represent uh, Myopax here today. And our aim is to fight muscle wasting and to rebuild muscle by making use of the um, primary human muscle stem cell. Um, so we are not a founded company yet, but we are a future spin-off of the University Hospital in Berlin, the Charité, and the Max Delbrück Center for Molecular Medicine and Basic Research Institute. And we are medical doctors and researchers with profound knowledge on taking care for patients with muscle diseases, uh, on muscle research, and on cell therapy manufacturing. Um, muscle, or in a multitude of very different diseases, muscle tissue degenerates and is thus no longer functional. First, uh, um, muscle atrophy may be the consequence of very severe disorders such as cancer, and then this muscle wor wasting worsens the prognosis of the primary disease um, vitally. We know over 50 different entities of hereditary muscular dystrophies leading to inability to walk, to respiratory insufficiency, and then to death. And local muscle defects may lead to distinctive but functionally very crucial impairments just that just the inability to breathe on your own or incontinence. And all these diseases have in common, they are untreatable and the social and the individual bur burden are really immense. Um, but actually the muscle has one big advantage. It harvests its own stem cells and these cells are highly potent in regenerating muscle even until old age but unfortunately it has not been able to use the cells so far for therapy because when you take them out of the muscle tissue and cultivate them in the lab, they are quickly overgrown by co-isolated fibroblasts and they also quickly differentiate. And today we know that only the very first stages, so the satellite cell stages, truly promote regeneration and this is where we come in. We've invented a new isolating and cultivating method which allows us to produce pure and highly regenerative muscle stem cells from a small muscle specimen from a single patient. And when we retransplant those cells into a mouse muscle, also the human cells into mouse muscle tissue, they truly build up muscle and they also uh, refill the muscle, muscle's own stem cell pool allowing for long-term treatment effects. And uh, this is what we want to use now for in an autologous therapy setting. So taking a muscle biopsy, producing the cells, and um, um, retransplant those cells at the site of impairment. And there are also other companies, of course, working on cell therapies against muscle wasting, but they all use other cell types than we do, so others than the satellite cell. And the big advantage of the satellite cell is that it has this high regenerative potential and at the same time a very, very low risk profile. 
and um, there are multitude, uh, it's really a multitude of diseases that would profit from such a therapy with uh, common diseases such as respiratory insufficiency and with distinct muscle disorders. And we have selected a uh, rare prenatal developmental disorder. It's called Epispadias for our first one to a clinical trial. And here we aim to reconstruct an incompletely developed bladder muscle sphincter and to cure an otherwise lifelong urinary incontinence by one-time treatment. And uh, although the patient population is, or disease is very rare, the patient population is very well accessible and uh, it's only treated in few centers and the outcome measures are very well uh, measurable by objective parameters. And um, I said the disease is rare, there are only 200 newborns within the EU each year, but as also the 25 year olds from today are in need for a therapy, uh, the, the patient population is much larger. And if we calculate with therapy costs of 150,000, which is less than half of the current medical expenses, uh, we end up with a quite high revenue only for this very rare disorder. And as I said, our disease or our therapy would be applicable to many more disorders. So where are we in the developmental process? We are able to manufacture the cells according to pharmaceutical standards. We have started our preclinical safety and we will enter latest 2021 our first clinical trial. And we seek for an email approval by 2025. So uh, taken together, we have a frozen vial. It contains human muscle stem cells and we aim to use these cells to treat today untreatable muscle wasting diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Verena. So does anybody have any questions for Verena in the audience? Do I see any raised hands? Yes, we have one. Hello, I'm Alex Caldi from the European Platform on Nanomedicine. Just a, a question, you were mentioning the fact that you didn't choose iPS cells that would avoid the biopsy, uh, you, could, you could take some blood from the patients, reprogram the cell. Is it for, I mean, risk over benefit uh, ratio? Can you take some cells and do some partial reprogramming to avoid some risks? Okay, as, um, yeah, actually for us now, it's really a, a matter of a, a fast approach to develop the therapy. There are many, many cell types that you could use. It has actually been shown that the muscle stem cell is um, need, uh, you need the muscle stem cell to promote muscle regeneration, so other cells are not possible. You could go through the IPS cells. The methods to do this in muscle are not too good right at the moment. And then we also know that these cells, these muscle stem cells, you don't have scattered muscle tumors. Um, uh, you don't ha just have them. So um, it's really a safe option to rebuild muscle. And this is what we do. <laughs> Okay, another question here in the audience. Doesn't look like it. Okay, I'll ask you a question then. Um, yeah, well, kind of how I started, right? So why do you think that myology and muscle wasting, why do you think that it doesn't get that much attention as some of these other diseases that we hear about? I mean, I guess it's all a question of how many people get the disease, but still it's something you really don't hear that much about. And we've never had anybody before you having a solution for that? Um, actually, uh, obviously it seems that it's quite hard to target most of the muscle diseases. The only muscle diseases which is very well treatable is an autoimmune disease. And it's also very, uh, or it's also treatable because it, um, Onassis was affected and he put it a lot of money into the research to do this and to set up the therapy. Most of the diseases we are talking about are really, really rare. Um, but actually, I think that what the governments have actually, they have passed laws and they have um, uh, given a lot of incentives to do this kind of therapies and actually it now, um, yeah, um, brings something into the market and also in our muscle field we see now the first things um, going into larger clinical trials and really p with promising results and I think they will come up the next year with a lot of potential therapies. <laughs> Thank you, Verena. So our next venture sounds wildly futuristic and also a bit scary, I think. Please welcome Maria Levin from the company Nat Natera, Natera, right? Yes. Natera. Hello, 
everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, so uh, my name is Maria Levine. I'm the Director of Business Development and Marketing at Netira. Uh, so essentially, we all know that the healthcare and industry is moving forward in a very, very uh, fast uh, pace. And we already have uh, uh, the, uh, robots that do surgeries, DNA manipulation techniques. And still in the uh, field of uh, vital signs monitoring, we require the uh, assistance of a nurse or a, a doctor to measure our vital signs. And essentially, when we looked into vital signs monitoring, we uh, saw that there are many technologies and many methods to monitor vital signs, but uh, some of them are expensive, uh, require a contact, direct contact to the patient, sensitive to motion. Some of them require charging. Others infringe on uh, uh, privacy, like cameras. Uh, and so on and so forth. Natira approached this uh, challenge from a completely different angle. Our sensor is composed of a micro radar working on very high frequencies of about 120 uh, gigahertz and advanced proprietary algorithms which are essentially the brain of the system. And the way we do it is uh, we measure a tiny micron-sized vibrations which are created on the skin with every heartbeat, what is, what is called a ballistic cardiography. And essentially today we uh, measure uh, these major ECG and pulmonary metrics like heart rate, respiration rate, heart rate variability, respiration amplitude, essentially how much air enters into the lungs with each breath, and uh, human motion. The uh, sensor uh, essentially is a very, very small component uh, which we aim to work with integration partners to integrate into uh, medical devices into hospital beds. Uh, essentially, uh, our major advantages are that we are completely contact-free, meaning we can measure those metrics from um to up to 2.3 meter range. We are very flexible in our integration. As I mentioned, the uh, component can be integrated into various uh, installations. Um, and essentially, also, when we speak about uh, um, uh, vital signs monitoring, we also speak about the challenge of motion. Uh, and what do I mean by that? With every movement that we make, whether it's the heart beating, whether it's breathing, whether it's moving our hands, uh, and I'm not even talking about you know, sitting in a moving vehicle, we create vibrations. And those centimeter to millimeter size vibration mask the signal that we want to measure from the vital signs, be it any technology uh, that we want to use, whether it's camera, whether it's laser, uh, whether it's radar. And essentially, uh, the problem is essentially that uh, those large vibrations, that, as, as I mentioned, they mask the signal. And essentially, Natira solved this problem by introducing motion compensation algorithms that can uh, uh, distinct the signal coming from the vital signs from the external noise. And this is a very, very uh, big advantage when you want to measure a person in a real world environment, when he's moving in he his hands, when he's speaking, and so on and so forth. So this is another uh, major advantage of ours. I would also like to uh, speak about our use cases. So of course, patient monitoring, baby monitoring, elderly care, telemedicine. Um, our uh, sensor is even being used in pre-integration projects in the, uh, with automotive partners that uh, use it to monitor driver awareness uh, uh, and fatigue levels and so on and so forth. So just imagine if we can uh, provide accurate results in this hectic environment, uh, think about a room environment or a hospital environment, what we can uh, provide uh, uh, there. Uh, this uh, uh, very deep tech technology was enabled by a multidisciplinary team of uh, experts. Our CEO, Mr. Isaac Littman, has more than 20 years of experience as a business leader. Our CTO has more than 30 years of experience in the semiconductor industry. Uh, working at Intel and other companies. We have a medical director on board who is also a practicing physician, uh, Dr. Ariel Drory. Uh, we have a director of IP and legal affairs. This is just to show that we take our uh, uh, patent strategy uh, very, very seriously, uh, and so on and so forth. So, as I said, I'm very happy to be here today. We are uh, looking for uh, partners such as medical device uh, manufacturers, uh, such as uh, uh, medical equipment manufacturers and others uh, who would like to tackle 
uh, 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 different problems. You know, we witness the growing elderly population, and uh, hand by hand, we're also seeing a shrinking number of uh, uh, the medical uh, staff uh, and uh, nurses. So uh, we believe that our solution can provide uh, um, new answers for uh, the digital age. So thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Well, that was very, uh, wow, very, re very revolutionary presentation or very, re very revolutionary idea. Does anybody have any questions for Maria about this? Lots of questions, okay. Um, hi. I, uh, I did I get it right. It's a contact-free sensor. It's not a, a w something I wear. Exactly, exactly. And um, I even have a sample here of our current system. This is the evaluation system we use for uh, pre-integration projects. Essentially, it's a chip. It's an eight by eight millimeter chip that can be integrated, as I said, into medical devices, into hospital beds. You know, bec because we can measure also through materials like plastic, like ceramics, and so on. So the integration is really, really flexible. So the background of my question is, um, you can measure then several people with one sensor, right? How do you distinguish one person? If, if for example, you uh, mentioned a car, if you have several people in a car, you have to measure the um, status of the driver uh, and not of the person who sits with him in the car, right? So currently, uh, this is a, a per person measurement. Uh, in the future, in our roadmap, we also have a plan to develop a scanning uh, solution which will enable to uh, monitor several people in one space. But uh, for the car, for example, the uh, sensor, the target is to integrate the sensor inside the seat so that it will enable to monitor the driver, you know, when the car is moving. Okay. People here, I don't know. Okay. Hi, yeah, uh, I would like to know how, how's the powering of the sensor, how do you store your data, and what do you do to protect and secure your data? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So essentially, as I mentioned, we're talking about a component. This is a chip that uh, um, will be integrated into the system. So if we're talking about a medical device, for example, it will be uh, integrated uh, inside a module, which will be powered uh, the way that the device is powered, essentially. Uh, regarding your questions of uh, uh, privacy protection, so part of our solution will also be a cloud platform. It will be HIPAA compliant, and we will follow the, the required regulations, whether it's in the EU, in the US, or uh, you know, in any other territory. There was one more question here, I think. Yeah. Thank you, quite interesting. Um, I would like to ask that device you showed before, it's a minimum viable product, right? Yes, so uh, I didn't mention the uh, current uh, development uh, where we are right now. Uh, essentially, we are right now in the scaling up uh, process. We intend to release our first commercial project in the second quarter next year. Uh, so yeah, you can say that. Okay, so um, you as I understand it in the right way, you also need a software um, where you can modify also the data because if you integrate it into the beds, um, you have to get the weight of, of the patient, for example. So where do you modify those data? So our uh, sensor comes also with the user interface where uh, we uh, show, for example, for heart rate, you know, we show the different metrics, mm -hmm. but uh, in the uh, commercial use cases, this will be a case by case. For example, a hospital yeah. that would like to connect us to the electroni electronic records of the patient will be able to do so. Uh, we will also be able to provide connectivity to a mobile app, okay? V very much depends on the uh, use case itself. Is it hospital environment? Is it for uh, uh, medical professionals? Is it, is it for family members? In this case, we will have probably a dedicated app. Uh, but this is something that will be uh, kind of developed uh, maybe by third party as per the use case. Our uh, uh, core offering is a bundle of uh, a chip plus software. Uh, which is essentially for monitoring the vital signs, but as I said, we will follow according to the use case and can develop additional add-ons such as mobile app or connectivity to electronic records. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that's uh, it. Maria, thanks so much, that was amazing. Thank you. Where can you buy stock from your company? Um, our, so we're down to our fifth and final venture. I guess most of us are familiar with the killing the mosquito with a bazooka approach to oncology. Um, this, our next uh, venture uh, offers a welcome alternative. Please welcome Massimo Bocchi. Did I say that right? Bocchi, yeah. Bocchi. <laughs> From Cellply. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. So uh, Cellply is a company working on uh, personalized medicine and specifically precision oncology. And we are developing a platform for uh, uh, personalizing cancer treatment through uh, the so-called functional precision medicine. Um, today, there are about 18 million cancer patients uh, uh, that every year get the disease, and uh, about half of them will move to a later stage, unfortunately, and then develop resistance to the treatment. And only 7% uh, of the advanced cancer patients uh, actually benefit of the current approach, uh, which is based on uh, uh, genetic profiling, essentially. So uh, we have a huge problem in matching drugs and patients, and this is also reflected on the industrial side by the fact that uh, also in drug development, 95% of the oncology trials actually fail. So uh, after more than 20 years of development in the genomic field, uh, this is the result. So uh, about 15% uh, of the patient uh, with an advanced cancer can actually benefit of, uh, uh, mm, of a, a, a genomic guided mm, treatment. And uh, uh, only 7% in the end uh, are uh, uh, really responding to the treatment. So the huge problem is that 85% of the patients do not have any known mutation. So we need to change the approach if we want to provide a solution also to these patients. And one of the possible solutions, which is very interesting, is functional profiling, functional precision medicine. The concept is very easy. We want to test uh, the drugs not on the patient, but on the patient's tumor. So the idea is to test in vitro if the living cells of the patient are uh, killed, essentially, by the drugs, and see if this correlates with the uh, outcome of the patient. It is interesting that uh, we are not the only one doing this. There is a, a scientific community that is growing exponentially in developing this kind of uh, uh, approach. But where we are unique is the fact that uh, today there are no platforms <coughs> if you want to run this kind of test. So this is still uh, under development uh, in many labs, but you don't have a, a standardized technology for carrying out this kind of test. So what we have done is what you see in this picture. So we start from a, a sample, can be blood, bone marrow, in the case of uh, hematological uh, cancers, or a biopsy in case of solid cancer. We have a consumable kit uh, with a microfluidic device inside and a software to calculate the uh, optimal dose for the patient. Then we have an analyzer, a hardware that uh, runs the test autonomously, and finally a software that extracts information from the images we collect from each patient. A little bit more uh, details on the, the technology. So the core technology is this device I have in my hand. Here we can recreate 20,000 uh, micro tumors uh, for each patient. Then the uh, second step is that using uh, artificial intelligence and imaging, we can recognize uh, uh, the selected spots that are representing better mimicking, if you want, uh, the in vivo tumor. And the last step is that we expose the cells to multiple treatments in parallel and to see which is the best uh, uh, treatment for that sp specific patient. This kind of approach takes about 24 to 48 hours, depending on the drug type. And we have uh, mm, several patents uh, pending or granted on this technology. Uh, we have a pipeline that is, uh, <coughs> uh, st we started working on uh, uh, blood cancers and we are now moving, uh, uh, slightly moving now to the solid uh, tumors, uh, starting from lymphoma. Uh, just a couple of examples. This is a trial we started on uh, acute leukemia, 
Here you see that uh, on 40 patients that we have uh, tested uh, in this trial, we can predict uh, quite uh, in a good way if the patient will respond or not to the treatment. So in this chart, you see that uh, the supply score on y-axis is very small after 24 hours if the patient is not responding af after uh, months of treatment. The opposite if the patient is instead responding. Uh, we have also developed a new concept for immunotherapy testing. So since we can observe living cells interacting each other, we can select specific clusters where we have immune cells interacting with the tumor cells and see what happens when you uh, expose these cells to drugs. So this is an example in a multiple myeloma. We will present this kind of results at the HASH Congress in, a, in one month from now. Uh, in this case, what we can do is measure the fitness, let's say, of the immune cell, and uh, at the end of the day, not just count how many uh, uh, lymphocytes, for instance, or immune cells infiltrate the tumor, but also answer the question if these cells can be activated or not. Uh, we have several partnerships uh, with the clinics, uh, a very important partnership also with Charité Hospital. Um, we are currently, uh, open to expanding our collaboration with the other clinics and also to work with the pharmaceutical companies uh, to support their drug discovery, but also uh, clinical trial design processes. We are a team of uh, 13 people. I'm uh, one of the two co-founders. We have a, a serial entrepreneur, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship experience. Uh, we have a, a team uh, of uh, um, managers uh, with a strong scientific and a technical background. Uh, we are supported by several advisors, including Professor Bullinger from Charité, uh, uh, other experts uh, uh, in science and business, and uh, also we have a, a, an agreement with Roche, uh, which is supporting us with uh, one of his uh, senior by, uh, vice president. So thank you very much for the attention. Uh, this is a series of grants and prizes that we collected so far. We are now raising money for uh, uh, now the future development of the company, which is industrializing this technology and, uh, and uh, expanding our commercial activities. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Massimo. That was great. Anybody have any questions for Massimo in the audience? No questions. I kind of had a question, but I think you kind of answered it. Because <laughs> I asked you before, that's why you answered the question now. Okay. So I mean, there's a lot of, um, you guys are not the only, guy, only people doing this kind of thing. What makes you sort of stand out from the crowd? Well, uh, let's say the fact that there are other groups or companies doing this is uh, good for us because this is a new approach. Uh, where we are unique is the fact that we are uh, productizing, let's say, this kind of test. So other labs or companies are proposing this methodology as a lab-based uh, uh, technology, but uh, especially in diagnostics, if you want to have uh, a technology that should be adopted uh, in, a, in every lab, you need to decentralize the solution. So we are working on this while other let's say competitors or partners are working on specific, specific methods. So basically your tech or your, your, your approach or your, your, your plan is maybe to make something that's a lot more scalable, a lot more universal, and that could be um, yeah. implemented a lot in a lot more yeah, scalable fashion. What are your next steps or what are maybe some other ways you might want to diversify that or adapt that to other yeah, areas? Yeah, so uh, let's say the next steps is uh, our uh, first of all, uh, expand our collaboration. The fact we had this uh, collaboration with Charité is very interesting because that lab was not uh, empowered, let's say, with this kind of test so, uh, until we installed our platform. And now we, can, we are demonstrating that uh, they can run this test uh, because they have the technology in-house. So the next steps are uh, uh, we are now working with a, a multinational company on manufacturing, and uh, we will uh, start also the commercialization in the next year. 
and uh, so we need uh, some funding. Uh, so if there is some, someone interested in the par financial partnership, let's say we are happy to discuss about uh, about this. Thank you. Okay, cool. One more question over here. Thank you. So my uh, my question is: uh, It is globally accepted uh, that we can go for the the treatment of diseases like cancer without passing through the clinical trials or the animal test. Because what I understand from your presentation, it is you directly uh, uh, treating the cancer cell without passing through the clinical trials or the animal testing, which is globally accepted. So, uh, what do you think it is? A, it is the right way to proceed or because you have to accept the protocol what is the WHO or the other organization has established already. Yeah, uh, so the goal is not to uh, change, not to deeply change the regulatory pathway, at least for drug approval. So uh, if we are talking about supporting drug development, then we have uh, an additional tool that uh, helps pharmaceutical companies in designing the trial. So the problem we want to avoid is to launch a trial on a patient group that is not likely to respond to the treatment. So it's not uh, substituting uh, animal testing, not for now at least. Uh, if we talk about diagnostics instead, uh, yes, yeah, someone is using uh, PDX or some kind of technology for diagnostic purposes or to predict the response, but we know it's very hard to, to go to that through that way. So in that case, the idea is to add something new, uh, but there is a, a need for that. So, but uh, on a, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, we are not uh, removing the concept of getting approval of the drug in the standard way. Thank, thank you so much. Anybody else? All the way in the back. Uh, hi, I'm Martin Blomer from Young Leaders for Health. Again, uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. It was really an interesting approach to yeah, personalizing cancer care. So my straightforward question would be, do you already have an estimate what the per patient cost would be of your device? Uh, so can you repeat the question? What the per patient um, price would be of applying your device in a lab or in a clinical setting? Okay, uh, let's say uh, mm, there is no single question because it depends on uh, if you do a clinical use or research use. For clinical use, uh, I can just say that we think we can align to what the market is proposing now, which uh, roughly speaking is in the two to 4,000 per patient uh, for uh, testing a panel of drugs, which is what the market is proposing. We still have no standard price because we are not yet on the market, but we think that the, if we achieve this kind of uh, accuracy in predicting uh, the, the outcome of the, the treatment, then why not proposing this kind of price? Um, which is, to me, could be high or low depending uh, on the drugs uh, you combine with. If you have a, a CAR T uh, therapy uh, that is a half a million uh, cost, then the, we might discuss about what could be the right price for this uh, kind of technology. So it really depends on the, on the specific application. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so if there's no more questions, that's basically, yeah, I know. Okay, so it, if we have a little time here, so we were, uh, it was requested of me that we have all of the various ventures, speakers come back up and we take a group photo before we leave. Thank you very much. Um, just a reminder, if you want to speak to these people, you can speak to them obviously now or during the afternoon. They will be around, it's in particular at this table, like from this direction on the left side before you get to the main entrance.
I mean, Daniel. People will have the answer. 